devices and gaming definitely is an important thing that most people do on a lot of these devices. And so some trends that show that you know, over a period of time, the gaming uh, devices have been growing. People have been looking at you know, more than one device on which they game. And how many of you use more than one device at home to do some gaming? A lot of you, right? Me too. So I do phones, you know, I have consoles, tablets, so we all do that. And the second part, obviously, is no, no surprise, right? So we want to have a cross-platform, but HTML5 is not quite there yet. So from a performance standpoint, it's the biggest gripe that every developer will have, that you know, we can do good enough cross-platform with this. And obviously, the bigger problem now is that we have a lot of new trends coming. So people, you know, we have great announcements on virtual reality. There's, I just saw in CES some announcement around smart glass and how you can augment your games um, and cross-platform and you know, re augmented reality-based games. So what, what does it all mean? The hardware is very capable, but if you want to do cross-platform, we really need to catch up on the software side and make it happen. Otherwise, a lot of this is going to be native, and we won't be able to take it forward on a cross-platform front. So that's, that's the motivation for us to look at this. right? So, and we said, OK, uh, our mission then in that case is, how can we enable this great desktop class gaming experience and bring it to all devices, and devices with varying capabilities? And so. So this is something that you know, Samsung's uh, ecosystem would look like. So you have all these categories of devices that exist in Samsung's ecosystem. And we want to enable on these devices uh, really good quality gaming experience. And if you want to do that, I think it's, it's going to be all these ca you know, categories of games. So today, I think uh, casual probably is the one that gets close enough attention on the uh, HTML5 front. But you know, there's mid-core gaming and really core gaming, uh, which is non-console based. If you can enjoy uh, not, not having to do native, then it's great. And uh, so we have looked at you know, 2D as well as 3D aspects of gaming and how performance in each of those vary. And uh, obviously, uh, the, the three important paradigms we look at is HTML5 and JavaScript engines, the uh, heterogeneous computing, which I'll talk to you about in a little bit and uh, how we can actually bring these to game engines and how game engines can take advantage of it so you know, developers uh, like you can actually build some great games uh, using the hardware's power. Okay, so, uh, so PC gaming, uh, so I think this is no surprise to most people. So if I take a look at what a PC is and what a phone can do and what a wearable is or any of the smaller devices are, there's huge footprint variance across memory Right? You can go anywhere from 8 GB to 8 MB or less. And there is differences in cores that you have to consume, 1 to 16 or 32. And there's, if you look at the JavaScript engine, you know, how it's tuned to the performance, there is actually a lot of variation in that as well, as to even if there's a web engine that runs on it. And if you look at the device itself, from a hardware standpoint, there's a lot of capabilities. And every year, you know, people squeeze in more capabilities on the hardware. Right, there is multi-core, which is you know, MIMD capable. There's graphics with tons of cores. There's audio processing, image processing, so you name it. Everything has an engine and a pipeline that you can explore and you can use it effectively for your uh, gaming optimization. So from there, you know, we, uh, so if you look at the computing, what's, what, what's happening. So I think how people have traditionally explored and exploited this uh, at a higher level is it all started with OpenGL uh, and DirectX uh, way back between in early 2000s. And uh, you know, the standard actually helped stream processing, right? So you were able to do you know, a lot of uh, you know, the shaders and uh, uh, vertex programming, basically the, the streams of multiple data that you can bring to a graphics core, right? And uh, this enabled you to do the graphics optimization uh, alone. And you actually took it next step forward, and the CUDA came along and OpenCL, and obviously you were expanding the range of things that you want to be able to do, and so the GPGPU programming was born, so more general purpose computing, uh, but something that is more constrained in the graphics realm, right? It's not highly very intensive complex operations, but something that a graphics core can actually handle. 
And so this is where uh, we think we are right now, which is where WebGL, um, I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion throughout that as well. And so we're introducing what we're talking about, we'll talk about WebCL, which is sort of the counterpart to WebGL, where uh, we can do a lot of the cross-platform processing. So uh, the concept, what, it, what we call as heterogeneous computing comes into play, and I'll talk a little bit uh, right now. So the idea is your core is very capable with all these different engines, and you want to be able to take at a, a very highly abstracted level, in, at the web level, um, advantage of everything and write a very simple um, kernel that can actually take advantage of this. And uh, we think we're going to much more heterogeneous computing, which we'll call a heterogeneous cloud computing, where you, know, you will have more complex workloads in the future, and they're going to be divided more between you know, the device and the cloud. And so obviously we need to enable this today so that we can enable that future soon, which is not far away. We already have a lot of cloud gaming, but the device itself uh, needs to have the ability to split the load between the cloud and the uh, device so that we can take advantage of it. So that's where I think we're calling it as the heterogeneous parallel computing era. So uh, using all the hardware resources and really exploiting a lot of parallelism to take advantage of it and get the most performance is how we're going to get to that high quality cross platform games we talked about. Okay, so what is heterogeneous parallel computing? Simple. Um, it, the, the idea is the, all these things that are shown at the bottom, the hardware component, the processing power is there today in the hardware. CPU, GPU is very capable. But if I ask you the question, do you know how much of that capability? you actually know how to use in your games, or you actually understand that you're using it fully to de develop the best quality games. And I suspect a lot of you can answer that directly, right? We all optimize and try to get the best performance for that given game, but we actually don't know what, how, how far we can go and how, how good a game we can actually develop on top of it. And that's mainly because the application and the frameworks are not mature enough to enable very granular access to these devices and really be able to measure those performance so that you can actually tune and say, hey, you know, my graphics actually is this capable. Oh, okay, maybe I can actually do these other things on the graphics side, while the compute side can take care of these other issues. Well, we don't have all, this, uh, all the answers right now, especially in the web realm, uh, it's far behind. And I think that's, uh, that's one of the key issues uh, and the, the idea of parallel computing across multiple uh, course is what the concept of heterogeneous computing is, and that's where we actually are today. So now, uh, given that, I think, uh, so this is just a quick intro slide saying that, you know, we actually have a lot of parallelism. Uh, believe it or not, everything that we do, you know, if you want to find parallelism, there's a lot of areas where we can find parallelism. It's just that, for example, graphics has traditionally done that for rendering part of it. Right? But if you look at all of the logic and the computation, there's significant amount of uh, parallelism, and I'll show you in, in gaming where you can find parallelism. And people, uh, it's usually a hard learning curve to understand how to use parallelism effectively. And also, uh, the fact that people uh, don't know uh, what is data parallel and instruction parallel, and they actually give up, uh, not understanding that data parallelism is where you get the most benefits in parallelism. So, uh, so some examples, right? So you look at 3D graphics, all those are examples of parallelism. Video is actually becoming uh, you know, much more richer formats, and of course, a lot of these can be, uh, and the video uh, engine uh, is getting more powerful to render these things. And same thing um, with image processing. So when you look at, uh, so, okay, so WebCL. So what WebCL uh, is, is, in simple words, it's an engine, uh, it's just, uh, a binding that we have developed uh, for JavaScript that exploits OpenCL kernel. And you can develop um, on the web layer you know, simple kernels which can exploit the raw parallelism that your device provides. And when I talked about one core to 32 cores, that's where this, uh, this comes in, right? Knowing the capability of the device, you can easily write the kernel and you can go between devices and tune it very easily. And that's the idea behind using WebCL uh, for your development. So, so the goal is it, it gives you high performance, enables a uh, lot of compute-intensive applications. 
It is uh, platform independent, right? It's portable um, across multiple heterogeneous devices. And uh, so obviously you can write a game for your desktop. And when we talked about our vision, it was, hey, can I have the desktop level gaming onto my other devices? Yes, you can. And this is a starting point that where you can start exploring that concept. OK, and uh, currently, just like WebGL uh, was standardized, you know, it's going through Chrono's standardization process. So, uh, so that's something that we have worked on. So, so the takeaway should be for high performance web computing, if you want to think of one word, think of WebCL and uh, learn more about it and see how you can use it effectively. And why WebCL? I think there's a lot of use cases that we have looked at personally that WebCL helps with. Uh, 3D gaming obviously is a big one because a lot of data parallelism. And then big data, uh, augmented reality, video processing, uh, photography, we have use cases that we have looked at from uh, all of these areas. Okay, and um, so this is a simple introduction on how uh, it plays out in our operating system, Tizen, that we have developed. So Tizen has uh, the native libraries uh, in which OpenCL uh, can be actually integrated. And we have done that for uh, some uh, OpenGL uh, ES for uh, Cairo, and we have done um, OpenCL integration into the core for native libraries. And on top of that, you know, we have the web engine, right? And the web uh, runtime actually integrates WebCL. And uh, that's where you can uh, access WebCL. And framework will sit on top of it, which can talk to WebCL and, uh, if in, a, in, in effect, talk to OpenCL and go down and access the hardware. And so those are some of the frameworks. Uh, you probably are familiar with a lot of these. And uh, um, anybody can integrate those into the frameworks to make it happen and uh, the gaming applications on top. So if you wanted to know um, in gaming arena where WebCL plays a big uh, picture, big role, these are all the areas that we have actually personally looked at. So collision detection, so any you know, 2D and uh, 3D uh, in a di rigid body dynamics or soft body dynamics, it's all compute intensive and it's got a lot of parallelism already in it. So the best way you wanna write this is using a WebCL kernel so that your device actually doesn't run too hard doesn't uh, gets power managed properly, and you actually use all the cores effectively. And uh, soft body, fluid body, pathfinding, vision cones, dynamic simulation, you know, any of these, and, and all the high-end gamings today, you would find any of these effects. And uh, you know, definitely WebCL is the best candidate that you can explore with this, this with. Okay, and uh, so if you take a look at how WebGL came about, I think I put in you know, some timelines here. You know, it started in 2006 from Mozilla. Uh, it's an experiment that came out. It went through standardization in 2011. Obviously, uh, you know where we are with this. There's a lot of uh, uh, adoption talks that's happening right now. Uh, browsers are adopting it. And uh, there are a lot of popular apps. There's you know, multiple frameworks that already support WebGL. So, so WebGL took a while, but I think people have you know, started embracing this for their gaming, and that's giving you the, the render side of the performance. Now what we're saying is on the compute side where uh, we need you know, much more uh, use of the heterogeneous computing, WebCL can help. So use WebCL along with WebGL and you're able to use more of your course effectively. Okay, so, so that was a quick introduction. Um, and uh, so we'll go a lot more deep into WebCL and you know, how it actually works, how the uh, uh, how you write a kernel with it, and how it's, and we'll have some examples and some demos, and Swarup is there to walk you through it. Thanks. All right, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Thanks, Satish. Uh, so uh, before diving into this, I uh, just want to get a sense of, uh, you know, uh, how many of you have uh, kind of worked with OpenCL or know about OpenCL already? Not many, okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, I'll just step through some of the basics of what OpenCL is all about and you know, how it can really help uh, in game, game development. So first of all, it's, um, it's a programming model um, and the syntax is kind of very similar to C. It's in fact based on C99. 
And uh, it has this concept of what's known as uh, kernels. So these are, you can think of them as, uh, you know, the equivalent of shaders uh, for your compute intensive operations. So these are uh, actual, uh, you know, programs that uh, you can schedule to be run in parallel. And OpenCL runtime uh, supports runtime uh, build and compilation of uh, these kernels. So you supply this uh, source, uh, you know, in uh, clear text, and the runtime has the capability to compile it and run it uh, kind of, you know, just in time. That doesn't mean you can't do uh, pre-compilation. You can definitely do that. But uh, the fact that it can do that at runtime is, you know, kind of helpful for web applications uh, in general. So you could really uh, transport your source uh, in clear text or, you know, whatever format, and then get it uh, built on the end device you're trying to run it on, right? And um, it, it comes with, uh, you know, a, a lot of nice things in terms of uh, what you can really do with, uh, within the kernels. It has a very rich set of built-in functions. It's very similar to uh, what you would see in libm, for example. And uh, it supports accelerated math op operations, you know, fast math, you can enable that. So uh, essentially, uh, it, it's a pretty powerful, uh, uh, you know, runtime uh, to exploit the hardware uh, richness that you kind of witness in most of the devices today, right? And in terms of uh, the programming model, uh, you know, essentially, you, uh, you have a host. So uh, in OpenCL terminology, a host is a program that is actually using OpenCL. So you have some kind of a program like uh, written in C, C++, Java, or a web application that is controlling how OpenCL is operating. So that is traditionally being re referred as the host. And you have an OpenCL device, which, is, which are, you know, uh, essentially a collection of computing uh, units. So you, you could roughly equate them to cores on your processor or uh, cores on, on the GPU. And then they are comprised of what are known as uh, processing elements or, uh, you know, they are roughly equal to threads. So this is where a single uh, execution happens within... Uh, you know, uh, at runtime. And then <coughs> the code uh, can operate in both SIMD and SPMD mode. And uh, essentially, you know, it, it gives you uh, the ability to take maximum advantage of uh, the hardware that you have. That's the idea there. And in terms of uh, the programming model, as I mentioned earlier, you have this uh, kernel, uh, which is essentially a basic uh, executable code, uh, similar to a C function that, uh, you know, you could uh, achieve both data parallelism and task parallelism. OpenCL supports both. And uh, you have a program, which is a collection of kernels and other functions. So kernel is something like a main function in C, if you will. So it is something that you could invoke from the host program. And you could have other functions, which, uh, which could be, uh, you know, some kind of uh, routines that uh, you could call multiple times. So, and all these things uh, uh, clubbed together will make a program just like, uh, you know, any other native program, for example, or JavaScript itself, for example. And uh, you have a command queue on which you kind of schedule uh, what you want to execute. And the queue execution can be performed in order or out of order based on uh, what you want to achieve. There are uh, various considerations there. And uh, once you have all these things put together, uh, you have you know, a single uh, execution. So uh, let's say you have an eight core machine. And then uh, theoretically, at least, you could execute uh, eight instances of uh, you know, this particular kernel uh, concurrently. So that's the whole idea, right? You, you're executing them in parallel. So each of those executions, you can uh, equate to a work item. So that's, uh, it's something like a thread executing your program, um, you know, in the traditional sense. 
And then a work group is a collection of uh, these work items. And uh, essentially, it's something like uh, all the threads that are running on the same core, for example. So that's the logical view of things. Just to make it a bit more clear, if you take the example of uh, image processing, you could think of an image being divided into multiple, you know, Im image is actually built up of multiple pixels, let's say. And uh, based on what you're uh, trying to do, the granularity at which you want to achieve things could be, uh, you know, you want to work on individual pixels at a time. So when you map this onto an OpenCL kernel or an OpenCL uh, philosophy, each of these pixels can uh, become a work item within your uh, kernel execution run. And the tiles within, uh, you know, it's basically a, a collection of these pixels or neighboring pixels can become a work group. And the idea is that you could take this uh, piece of the image and then schedule it to work on a single core, uh, you know. And, you know, whatever is the algorithm that you're running, uh, you could take advantage of the parallelism that exists in the hardware. <coughs> in terms of the memory model that's uh, supported in OpenCL, it's a uh, uh, hierarchical model, just like what happens in the CPU. It, it has uh, a private memory, so each work item has a very small amount of private memory where it can store uh, you know, whatever is required, uh, register values, et cetera. And then you have a local memory that is local to a work group. So this is shared among all the work uh, items uh, within that core. So they, they can use this local memory model to share results, for example. Uh, and then at the next level, you have this global or constant memory. So this is a memory piece of memory that's resident on the actual hardware that you're looking at. So it could be GPU memory or CPU memory based on what you're targeting. And then obviously you have memory on the host side also. So um, the memory management model itself is kind of explicit in that uh, you as a programmer is uh, responsible for managing how you want to move memory uh, back and forth. So it's a, the responsibility kind of lies on the user here. Okay, so uh, let's look at one of the very simple kernels, right? So the idea here is you, you kind of map your problem into what are known as uh, n-dimensional computing domains. So for example, one easy way to kind of look at this is if you have an image, it's a 2D data structure. So you have height and you know, uh, width. And then if you're performing any operations on individual elements like pixels, so you would want to typically work in the 2D space. So in that case, it's a 2D uh, computational domain. And uh, similarly, if you're working on a mesh, the very simple way of looking at things is it's a 3D model. So you have X, Y, Z uh, dimensions there. So then it becomes a 3D uh, computation domain, right? And then the idea is that you can execute the kernel, which is the piece of logic that you want to uh, you know, use to compute something, to operate on a single point within this computational domain. So if you, if you have a 2D grid, you want this logic to work on each element in that grid. And similarly, if you have a 3D mesh, you would want your logic to work on individual elements of the, uh, you know, the mesh itself. So the, that's, that's how it maps into the computation or the n-dimensionality of uh, you know, programming or kernel programming there. So if you look at a very simple example, on the left we have a traditional loop that uh, you, know, you can write in any language. This is shown in C, but this, you know, in JavaScript, this is what you do all day long, right? So you uh, loop through your, so this, by the way, is doing vector multiplication, multiplying two arrays, for example. So traditionally, you would just uh, loop through your array, you know, multiply it and store it back, right? But in data parallel OpenCL, all you have to do is, you know, the, the syntax looks very, very similar. And even the lo logically, they're very identical. It's just that you have to take care of uh, managing where the memory is or what type of memory you're using. 
And then there are a few things that are kind of peculiar or you know, unique to OpenCL. And so as an example here, you know, uh, when you do this, this particular call called get global ID, you're really getting the ID uh, or you know, the index into the work item. So within this global set of uh, uh, you know, data that I have, what is my, my ID? And then you could use that to kind of retrieve data from this big chunk of uh, data that was sent to OpenCL in the first place. So in this uh, example, you know, based on the ID, you're just fetching the corresponding data and then writing it back to uh, the destination. And the nice thing is, you know, if you have multi-cores, uh, eight cores, eight of these operations are happening in parallel. So the speed up that you would see are actually very significant in terms of uh, the raw computing um, advantage there, right? So in terms of executing the program, you, you kind of go through a number of things from uh, the programming perspective. You look at what kind of devices that you have. So you, the, uh, as mentioned earlier, OpenCL is supported on multiple uh, types of devices. Your CPUs are uh, supported, GPUs are supported. There is work going on to support other types of uh, parallel hardware. But uh, today, you know, uh, most of the usage is around CPUs and GPUs. So you, you as a programmer, has, uh, you, you have the ability to uh, choose what you want to use for this particular use case, for example. So you query uh, all the devices that are supported. You choose one of the devices. And uh, you create a program, which is essentially a collection of uh, code that you already have written. And then you. Uh, you create these programs for execution, and then you uh, identify where you want the entry point to be, so which is essentially the kernel that you want to invoke uh, at this particular uh, point. And you manage the memory, uh, or you, know, you create the memory objects that you want to pass along. So in, uh, we'll see it a bit later, but in JavaScript terms, you could think, the, think of this as you know, having a uh, bunch of type diaries that uh, you're storing data in, and now you're pointing or you know, kind of pushing that uh, to the OpenCL layer for computation uh, in parallel. So that's what you, you're doing when you're copying data uh, into the device or copying it down the pipeline, if you will. And then you schedule these uh, programs that you have identified on the command queue for execution execute or you know, issue uh, an execute instruction to the command queue, and then you read uh, results back. So this is the typical cycle in uh, using OpenCL, right? So when we come to WebCL, the usage model is very, very identical. So even here, you kind of do the initialization where you're kind of setting up uh, your uh, you know, devices. You select what you want to uh, use, GPU or CPU or uh, if any other hardware is available, you would want to use that, et cetera. You create your kernel, which means that you have uh, the source code. Uh, you build that source code, create an uh, object uh, in OpenCL. And then you run the kernel, uh, which means that you're you know, passing all the data that is needed for um, executing this particular piece of code. And then you're executing the code itself, uh, which is scheduling uh, its run on the uh, hardware. So in terms of what it can do uh, out of the box is, you know, obviously the raw data types in terms of type diaries, if you're creating yourself, you can obviously pass them along. But you have uh, support for creating image objects. So if you're working on image, image processing, this is very, very handy. And then you could create image ab objects uh, based on uh, type diaries. Or you know, if you already have an image that you've put on this uh, on the uh, web page, either through an image tag or a canvas, or it could be a frame within your video tag, you could grab that and process that uh, using OpenCL. And also, um, you know, WebGL vertex buffers and WebGL textures. So. 
OpenCL has this capability to uh, play nice with uh, OpenGL, which means that you could grab a buffer from uh, OpenGL, do some processing on it, and then send it back to uh, OpenGL for rendering. So uh, essentially, this is the compute, uh, high performance compute counterpart for OpenGL. That's an easy way to look at this, right? So in terms of uh, actual code, uh, how would you, so this is WebCL again, how would you go about using WebCL, right? So the first thing to do is you look at all the platforms that you have. So when we, uh, what, does mean, uh, what do I mean by platforms is essentially you might have, you know, a set of CPUs and you have probably one or more GPUs uh, that, are, that come with the device. So when you do this get platforms, it essentially returns you a list of all the supported uh, platforms, GPU, CPU, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, you, you choose what you want to do. So for example, uh, you can say get devices of a particular type uh, with, from within the list of platforms that uh, you have. And you create what is known as a context. So this is essentially a handle into the OpenCL runtime or the device that you've chosen. And this is what you really use to uh, kind of go forward or execute things based on, right? And uh, as I mentioned, mentioned earlier, you have this notion of queues. So this is a command queue where you schedule the commands that you want to run. And you get that. And in terms of uh, the actual kernel code, um, <coughs> the syntax is, uh, again, very, very similar to uh, C, as I mentioned earlier. And you could embed them in, a, in your web page, uh, very similar to what you would do with a WebGL shader, for example. So you, you just have a script tag, and you you know, just put the source code there. By the way, this is not the only way to uh, bring OpenCL code into the program. You could, you know, uh, easily have uh, XML HTTP requests that will bring it in. You could read it out of a file, for example, or uh, any other mechanism that would let you bring in strings, for example. And then in terms of um, the uh, string, you're just, you know, uh, it's like reading source of, uh, script uh, element within your DOM. So uh, you pull that, use that to uh, create the program. So you're passing uh, in, in this particular um, you know, uh, statement where you're uh, doing context.create program, you're essentially uh, asking the uh, OpenCL runtime to <coughs> take the string and convert it into uh, an OpenCL program. And when you build it, this OpenCL program, you know, gets an equivalent uh, binary object created. That's what uh, program.build is doing. And as mentioned earlier, your program, uh, you know, might have a collection of kernels or collection of entry points that uh, you, you know, you put together. And <coughs> you need to get a handle to one of those. So, uh, you know, you might have a square operation happening. You might have I don't know, uh, matrix multiplication might be another kernel that you've written, and you have this library of kernels uh, that you're gonna use throughout your application. But by passing the particular name that you have, so whatever you have after kernel underscore underscore square, so that's, that's what identifies the kernel uh, name, and you pass that here to grab a handle to that particular uh, kernel. Next step is to um, run these kernels, right? So in, in this step, it's, it's, uh, so you have to kind of build the data that you want to pass and push it down the pipeline and execute the kernel. So that's what you're kind of doing at, uh, from a higher level. So in our case, we are creating a type array, populating it with a bunch of data, and then uh, you enqueue these uh, buffers so or you know data uh, data structures onto your OpenCL or WebCL uh, queue, and uh, there is a distinction between write buffer and read buffer. So write buffers are 
uh, things that you can, uh, I mean, uh, when you say NQ write buffer, you're uh, writing into the memory or writing into your OpenCL system. And at uh, the bottom, you're do doing a read back. So that's what NQ read buffer is doing. And uh, once you have the data set, you also want to set the arguments that you want to, or these are the formal parameters that you would uh, pass to your kernels. So those are the, uh, you set the kernel arguments. And the next step is to define the workgroup size. So uh, the idea here is, you know, you might have a particular data structure that you're working with. And based on what you're doing, you want, you're dividing it into multiple dimensions, right? So if it's an image, you might work with a 2D kernel uh, or a two-dimensional two uh, algorithm. If it's a mesh, you might be working on a three-dimensional algorithm. So uh, the idea here is, uh, or you, know, the, you can really define the granularity that you want to work with using this workgroup sizes. But for simplicity, here we are kind of letting the system choose what it wants to do in terms of uh, dividing the work up. And that's possible if you just have uh, one-dimensional data, or even for two-dimensional data. It's just that it's not completely optimized, that's all. And then <coughs> you enqueue the kernel, or you schedule the kernel for execution. And you basically, the queue.finish that you see here is a blocking call to you know, kind of flush your queue, or execute everything that you uh, scheduled uh, for execution on your queue so far. And then uh, once everything is executed, it comes back, you're ready, to, you're, uh, ready to read the results back into your program. And that's what you're doing at the end there, right? So another simple uh, example, it's uh, essentially you're uh, creating, uh, you know, uh, WebCL image object, so you already have an image from some source, uh, image tag, canvas element, or video, whatever it might be. All you need to do is to say, um, you get the, uh, you create the image based on, uh, let me see here, hold on a second. Yeah, you, you, you just create an image object in OpenCL based on the data that you have. So this might be the data that you, uh, uh, for example, read from your canvas, and then you have the corresponding image object um, on the OpenCL side. So in OpenCL, there is uh, you know kind of native support for working with images. It has a nice uh, set of API the, or functionality that uh, you can take advantage of in terms of achieving uh, good uh, speed up, right? So. So uh, essentially, uh, you could point to a canvas element, for example, uh, like we're doing here, and then you could read the uh, data in and work on that. Another example in terms of vertex animation, if you want to work on the vertices of a mesh, for example. Uh, again, the philosophy is uh, fairly uh, similar. You're kind of creating these buffers where you want to populate the data and then pushing them down. But instead of kind of creating this data on the JavaScript side, now we are grabbing it from the GL buffer uh, that you already have, because you kind of have a rendering representation uh, on the WebGL side, for example. And uh, so the, what it's showing here is you could uh, grab data from WebGL and then process it using the uh, WebCL and then send it back to uh, you know, the GL counterpart for rendering. So this is going to give you a lot of speed up in terms of if you're doing complex operations, right? <laughs> Similarly, you could achieve the same thing on textures. So you could create a, you know, a WebCL buffer from an existing WebGL texture, and you could pretty much do whatever you want in terms of computing on the texture uh, on the CL side or the compute side. And you could push them back to uh, GL for rendering. OK, so the, that's kind of uh, the overall introduction to how you would work with uh, WebCL. And in terms of uh, availability, uh, you know, uh, we kind of 
we have uh, a way of this working on the Tizen device. It's, uh, it works in this, currently in this hybrid mode where you build um, WebCL as a plugin and uh, you could use it for Tizen uh, applications. Uh, in the very near future, we're going to have native support for uh, Tizen, you know, WebCL in the browser itself on Tizen. Apart from that, uh, we do have a working implementation on uh, the PC, uh, works on uh, Mac Safari and Linux EFL port of WebKit, and it's available at that URL. It's very straightforward uh, to build and use, just make it and you know, uh, run the uh, browser and you'll have it working. You're welcome to contribute also if uh, anybody's interested in uh, working it out. All right, so let's look at some of the demos. So um, I'll show some of the demos on the screen also, but before that I can just give you a, a quick uh, video of what is happening here. So this is, uh, this is a simple application where it's uh, you know, calculating uh, some deformation on the objects that you see uh, within a skybox and rendering it within a skybox. So those spheres that you see, uh, they're being deformed uh, using some math background uh, in the background, basically. So as you can see in JavaScript, we, it's not even one frame per second, by the way. It's, it's taking way too long, but we're just capping it at uh, one. And in WebCL, as you can see, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's giving you significant speed up. So if you saw the times, it's 1400 versus 40 milliseconds. And you could even go down as we see in the next demonstration. It's, uh, you know, you, you can kind of work within the time budgets that you have. So, you know, either 16 milliseconds for 60 FPS or 32 milliseconds for 30 FPS. You could work, uh, do something, some nice things within that time budget uh, in terms of computing that you can do. So uh, we're putting together a gallery also. It's, it's not there yet. It's coming to, uh, together. Uh, this will be a nice place to uh, kind of work off of existing code and you could kind of take that and uh, make it your own by modifying a few things probably. Uh, this is something that's coming. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, we always look for collaborators, and uh, you're all welcome to work with us. And let's go to the demos, if they work. Um, All right, so this is our, our Tizen prototype. So the first demonstration I'm uh, going to do is uh, basically the video that you saw there, um, just to show that it's not, not a mock-up, it's something really working. So you know, without any uh, simulation or without any effect. So essentially, you could look, uh, think of this as a special effect that you would want to apply to your game, for example. So without anything, it's running at uh, 60 frames per second. I'm going to switch it to JavaScript mode. Uh, it's going to take a while. It's going to drop uh, in terms of the performance. It's giving you three milliseconds right now, for example. So this is a mesh of a lower resolution. Uh, the one that you saw in the video is a higher resolution mesh, but um, it, it's going to fall down even further. Now when we switch it to uh, the WebCL mode, you're getting a significant speed up again, uh, something like I don't know, uh, so many X, you know, uh, 30X or 25X in this case. So by the way, the speed ups that you get are not constant. They vary based on what you're really doing within the kernel. But uh, in this particular use case, you're getting uh, fairly significant speed up, right? So next application we want to show is, uh, let's see, rock and roll. Maybe I can put it this way, right? OK. So this is, again, I'm not going to go through the complete game. I'm just going to show uh, you know, the speed up part of it. There is a game also that's working. So here, 
the background, if you see the animation that you see in the background where it's kind of shaky, that's, that's what we're using WebCL for. So we're taking the texture um, uh, from uh, the game itself and we're kind of moving things around a bit to make it a bit dynamic. And if I, so uh, by the way, the current frame rate is somewhere between 45 and 55 or so. And uh, when we switch it to JavaScript, you see that it, it kind of drops significantly, right? So this is, um, 45 to 55 is acceptable uh, for, you know, game app, games, especially web-based games, I would assume. But if you're getting like six, seven frames per second with JavaScript, this is something that you really, really need to worry about. And in most cases, you would not use something uh, uh, like this, right? So, you know, this is another example. Uh, let's see, the next one. Where is toxicity? Here, okay. So this is another uh, simple example. Um, it's again the uh, sphere de deformation that you saw. We just put that into a uh, game concept here. The idea is that you have these objects that have been released and you need to pop uh, as many of them as you can uh, to kind of you know, save your city. So that's the idea. But uh, you know, right now, as you can see on the top right corner, the simulation is off. Let me switch to WebCL mode. The frames per second that we're getting is around 40 frames. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see, but at the bottom left corner. And switch to JavaScript. So by the way, the effect is very similar to what you saw in the spheres, right? So in JavaScript, we're getting five, six frames per second. So that's the kind of uh, you know, acceleration or uh, difference in uh, performance that you can expect. Uh, with WebCL, and you know, it's not again. It's it's not just limited to textures or meshes. It's it's uh, raw compute, right? So you could use it for other algorithms. For example, if you have, uh, I don't know, you, you want to do uh, collision detection for a particle system, for example, this could be handy there. Uh, we're working on um, some effects for soft bodies. It wasn't ready for uh, in time here, so we're not showing. But you know, uh, there again, uh, you have a lot of compute that you really have to do uh, apart from what you're doing on the render side. And we think WebCL is essentially the answer to uh, you know, such challenges. So with that, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. If you've got question, I've got the mic. <coughs> Hello. Uh, when, uh, we saw on the previous pre presentation, presentation that WebGL was available uh, mostly on every browser. So wh wh what about WebCL? So you, you said it was uh, working on Tizen. What about uh, Firefox, Chrome, or? So it's, it's a standard that's being worked on right now. So uh, unlike uh, web, uh, WebGL, which is you know, kind of adopted widely, uh, WebCL is in the standardization process. So we, uh, we've seen quite a bit of enthusiasm and interest from various vendors. And we hope that it's going to be widely available, at least as wide as uh, WebGL in the very near future. Hi. Uh, if you want to do a real-time computation, do, do we have to repeat uh, every step uh, with setting up the kernel? Uh, no, no. So this Just is once. like initialization, right? So you do that once, and once you have it, you could execute or kind of uh, invoke the kernel. So it's just the execution part that you might have to repeat all over again, which is you know, uh, q.finish, for example. Uh, once you, uh, but if you, if you have to retransfer data, that's also something that you'll have to do. So uh, for example, if, if you want to bring back the process results into JavaScript uh, for any reason, 
uh, that's another step that you would have to do every uh, execution. But otherwise, you do it once and you're set. And by the way, th this is the raw APIs that we're showing, right? On top of this, you could, uh, you know, we, we have initial versions of those also. You could have a nice abstraction, just like what 3JS and Babylon does for, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, games, for example and give you that API that is easier to work with also. So that's something uh, that will really help us, yeah. So uh, you just answered the question I was about to ask. Okay. But uh, do you know of any abstraction layer, I mean framework above WebCL about mm -hmm. to appear? Uh, because it, I, the, the whole thing, the low layer is going to be a bit complex for too many Everybody, people, yeah. I think. It, I it's extremely powerful, but you have so many things to, to masterize, it's going to be complicated. Uh, is there any framework in the pipe or anything? Yes, but, uh, you know. Yeah, we're working with a few you know, game framework companies, and uh, it's a work in progress. Nothing there that we can declare at this point, but when it's ready, yeah, we'll definitely make. So that's one of the efforts that we want to do, where one of the paths to make it widely available is integrating with game engines and making it available through that, so. Any more question? Before the break? Yep. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask about uh, Tizen. Uh, will it be released only on Samsung phones, or will it be available also on every other phones like I, I don't know. <laughs> I what, what? Uh, I'm not really sure on the uh, you know the product cycle of things. We are uh, I'm a part of a research lab here, so you know I know as much as you do basically. Okay, so you you don't know how, what what is the the level of advancement of the project uh, of the, uh, how, how much is uh, Tizen ready for the public and so on? I mean, it's an open source project, right? So everything okay. is in the, uh, in the open now. So you could go to Tizen.org, build your own image, put it on a hard piece of hardware and test it. But in terms of the products, that is something that I don't know. I, I kind of uh, <coughs> uh, I am familiar with the technical side of things. Okay. Uh, I guess all these are not exactly technical, so I can't answer that. I'm sorry. It's okay. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm using um, Tizen right now, and uh, on the 2.2 version, uh, we had a lot of person uh, had a problem with um, panic, dumb panic error. Do you have a fix for this problem? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I can't. Um, I'm using uh, Tizen right now, and um, a lot of person and me uh, have a problem with uh, in the starting uh, when I turn on the device, there is a dumb panic error, and the device <laughs> not turn on. Uh, I don't know. So is, is your image corrupted or something like that? Could be that, know. I'm not sure. I don't know, uh, I'm just turning on the, the, the phone and error and then shut down. Yeah, so probably, or I don't know, there could be multiple reasons. Your bootloader is corrupted or the image is bad. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, sorry. So maybe you've got specific question right to WebCL rather than Tizen. <laughs> No? So, uh, yes? Jean-Marc? We, we're talking in English here. Um, hi. I, I wasn't here for your presentation, so maybe I'll ask a question that you already answered. I'm very sorry. No problem. Um, um, today we have uh, OpenGL to WebGL bindings using mscript 10. Can we expect the same kind of bindings for WebCL and uh, OpenCL? So, for example, the Burlet Physics Engine could be hardware accelerated inside uh, Firefox, for example. That's that's a very good point. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's something that definitely can be done. Uh, we have not we have not done it yet, but uh, we are open to the possibility there. Yes, 
it's it's an excellent way of uh, you know utilizing what's out there sure sure yeah so well then uh, i'd like to thank you <laughs> thank All you right.